like it's a uh, Wednesday, and uh, this is the Bob McCown Podcast, yours truly, along with John Sh- Shannon. Ooh, that's a rather long one today. Extra what is long that? one today. <laughs> well, I started the hockey season? Is that one? No, I forgot your name. Um, I knew it started with an SH, but I couldn't remember the other syllables. I uh, know. Mo- most people spell it too, with two other letters, and it's easy to remember. Uh, here's a voice and a face that uh, needs no introduction, but I will anyway. Um, my friend Ron McLean of uh, Hockey Night in Canada joins us. Opening night of the NHL season, and uh, you're sitting at home. You're not working. Is that, That's not that unusual for you, though, is it? Uh, when, you know, back in the old days, um, you did you work a lot of opening nights? No, uh, we we used to do. I guess John, in the old old days, we did hockey night in Canada. Would always take the opener, the the NHL's face off night. Uh, but more recently, I think in the Rogers, uh, uh, the Scotiabank Wednesday night hockey has always opened without us. And I remember vividly uh, when TSN opened the season after the lockout that wiped out the entire year, when the 0607 season premiered, and all 30 teams at the time were in action, 15 games mm-hmm. that Wednesday night, and it was TSN. And I sat home watching. It's probably the most exhilarating opening night I've ever seen in the audiences you know that was the year we said oh we hate the owners we hate the players we'll never watch again <laughs> and of course uh, record ratings but uh, yeah it's a special night and I'm glad in a way Bob I don't know how you feel and John I, I need three or four nights I can't take my eyes off uh, the politics of America to I got to get to know who's playing like I looked at the Minnesota Wild lineup the roster the other day and I thought wow I think I know four players. So there, I tell you what, there has been a lot of change yes. on a lot of teams this year. And it, you're right. It's going to take some time. The, and the revolving door in goal. And to me, the goaltending, I mean, I, 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 I forgot who plays goal for whom uh, yeah. as of this morning. Driving well, in, I couldn't understand it. A really funny one on that. In 1996, I want to say, but it might have been 95. I guess it would have been the 95 beginning of the year. Nikolai Habibulin breaks in with the Winnipeg Jets. So we do our, our season premiere. Maybe you were in charge that night, John. It was uh, the form of 95, Montreal. Nine, nine, no, 95. It would have been 96. It was 95. We started in January. Okay. If you remember. Right. Remember, that's, that was right. the, that's the lockout uh, after that's the right. Rangers championship. Yeah, yeah, right. So anyway, I'm doing the telecast uh, for the, the beginning of the season in Montreal, and I'm pleased as punch that it's gone well and we're uh, in the final five minutes of the broadcast and we always would end with the scoreboard uh, scores around the NHL full board of all the people that had goals and the goaltender and how many shots they'd stopped and I had never seen that name Nikolai Happy Bulin <laughs> and I just murdered it uh, and I was so embarrassed uh, going off the air that night so there you go well I I assume that's happened a few times to you with no disrespect intended simply because we now we are in an era now where so many players, so many teams, so many Europeans um, that we aren't familiar with, you know, back in the day, we used to know the, know the kids who played junior hockey. So we knew them when they were 16, 17 years old. Now you got guys showing up from Europe, never seen, never heard of. I'll well, tell you plus, what, we got, we tell you what, uh, we had PJ on last week, Ronnie. Uh, and uh, number 15 for Montreal, he didn't even try. Yeah. He just called him KK. That's it. And that's <laughs> pretty frequent him. even now in our studio. Uh, it, well, and I just, you know, the internet, didn't, it existed beginning in what, 93? Uh, so uh, we, we would do those shows without the benefits, of, especially back in the beginning. We would do it with, like, we all had satellite dishes to try and follow the game with back all feeds. Uh, but we had yeah. no cell phones. We, we had maybe fax in the uh, 90s. <laughs> But so it was impossible to be up to speed now with Twitter. I mean, and with the internet and everything else, I mean, you, you can be a little more on top of it, Bob, but, but in the mid nineties, uh, there were a lot of errors. Uh, well, I'm going to date myself. So the, one of the first jobs I ever had on that show uh, was I would have to call the press box to get out of town scores. And when you started in 86 or 87 at hockey night, Ron, on those mm-hmm. Saturdays at the gardens, there was somebody, it might have been, you know, Jamie Campbell or Paul Romanuk, right. one of the young guys. That's, right. That's what their job was to, on a rotary phone, <laughs> phone every press box every five minutes. Hey, has anybody scored? Hey, what's your score now? Oh, it's still 2-1. Thanks very much. And press box attendants got used to, oh, here comes the guys from Hockey Night in Canada. They're calling again. And it happened every five minutes. And Bobcat, one of the neat things is in the history of the game, uh, as they 
hit television in 1952 and remember from 52 to 68 they didn't show the entire game which is just hard to explain you know to to go uh 17 years essentially with just a a period and a half of hockey on saturday nights just blows my mind but tom foley remember that name john the the host from many berries alberta who was really competent and killed in an accident uh, a cab leaving toronto airport uh, they, he and Ward Cornell had flown back from uh, Montreal or Ottawa, and he, he was Ottawa. killed in a car accident. Ottawa, thank you. Uh, but he would do highlights. Uh, so, so instant replay was kind of coming along in the late 50s, uh, and Tom Foley would do highlights of, obviously, there would only be two other games in the original six, and it was just like spellbinding to the viewer. This is a little ahead of my time, so I don't remember it, but I've certainly read about it, and I can just picture the the absolute fascination the viewer must have had when Tom Foley presented highlights of the other two games. With Ron McLean. Uh, How many games would you watch? Would you watch a game, at least one game every night? Yeah. I mean, I play hockey twice a week, so I kind of cheat those nights. I watch from a bar after the game, (laughs) but uh, I do love to that, that I don't know how you are with retention, but for me, hearing it, seeing it is uh, easier than reading. Uh, if I read something, I have to then write it down in order to remember it. Uh, so there's nothing beats, uh, and I love the beginnings of the games. You know, that's usually where we all give all our best stories in the first period. So for me, it's it's critical to watch the opening 20 minutes. And uh, like I really enjoyed the, this past weekend. Joe Bowen was unbelievable. They did the blue and white game. He and Cheryl Pounder, and he was throughout the night uh, really consistent with storytelling and. And I was grateful to see that, you know, so uh, that for me is, uh, is the greatest research of all. Well, I mean, well hey, just to, to me, the challenge of now, I mean, there's only one game on. I mean, that was Saturday night for me is, you know, you watched and you watched the Maple Leafs play the Maple Leafs, but there was only one game. I'm, I'm used to watching four yeah. at the same time. And, and now that, that to me is the challenge is, is in, in, in this ADD world in this, you know, instant, instant gratification world that we live in. I need more. I need more all the time. And my thing is to make notes. And, uh, you know, I, I probably have my notes from, I do, funny enough, uh, from that game, you know, Rourke Chartier had missed two years with a concussion. He's from Saskatoon. And I happen to know uh, a police officer out in Saskatoon, Patrick Nogé, whose son Nelson's in the Winnipeg Jets organization. So it was a big deal for Chartier to play again. I just made a note of that. I made note of the Barb Underhill comments that were made in the show. Uh, sure. Just, you know, all kinds of little things. And I was wondering, I have to go back and watch. Uh, but when Nylander wired the one-timer and when Robertson wired the one-timer, in the case of Nylander, he's a right-hand shot. And Kevin Bieksa taught us last year in the playoffs that a right-hand shot passing to a right-hand shot, the puck will have more velocity. It was a really fantastic uh, physics lesson that Bieksa taught us about how a lefty to a lefty or a righty to a righty uh, results in a more velocity on the shot. So now I got to go back and see, was it a righty that made the pass to Nylander? Uh, what are your expectations of this? Um, well, the first... COVID season of the NHL, we, we, we think, well, it's not really the first because they started last year um, shortly after the, the, uh, all the lockdowns, but really that was, that was something completely different. That was a, a couple of games of play in and then, um, a, you know, a full round of playoffs. Uh, now we're going to play 56 games. In a, in a regular season, over 110, 12, 15 days, something like that. What are your expectations? Well, I think the playoffs gave us a, a great example of how fantastic the game can be with no one in the building. And that seems really weird, but that goes back to uh, the reason they didn't show the first period and a little bit of the second on Hockey Night in Canada for 17 years is that Clarence Campbell and the owners felt that it would hurt the gate. Nobody would go to the games if it was on. Oh, that was the, ma- the major. Right. That was the major. That was Con. Uh, he and Jack McLaren came to that agreement on a golf course. Right. Uh, at one point, yeah. So yeah, you know, that was that was part of the history. You didn't want to hurt. You didn't want to hurt the gate. Yeah. You couldn't hurt the gate. So, but the but the fact is, it improved the audiences and uh, the places were jammed as a result of television. In fact, if you go back to World War II. In the UK, soccer, uh, they did very much what hockey's doing this season. They changed their whole alignment to, to be more regional, so there was little travel. They limited the number of spectators to 8,000, uh, and a lot of the places played with nobody in the uh, stadiums. Uh, and I, I just think it's, uh, Bob, you know, I, I, the hockey was so 
pretty much so genuine in the Stanley Cup. We got some amazing things happen. Steven Stamkos, Oscar Lindblom. Uh, I know we're going to have uh, issues with COVID-19. There's no doubt about that, but I, I think it's worth it. I think it, I, I liken it to wartime entertainment. I think of Bob Hope going over into danger zones. Uh, I think of, uh, you know, Vera Lynn. I think of a lot of different ways that we, it, here's another, maybe a little bit obscure, but I'm reading Frederick Douglass, you know, the great abolitionist and uh, women's right advocate. Mm -hmm. I'm reading his book right now. And he talked about payday on uh, the plantation. Uh, and it wasn't much of a payday. It was usually a food supply and maybe a garment. Uh, and he said, but the singing that took place on that day uh, was something to behold. And he never forgot the singing. And he said, we didn't sing to express uh, our happiness. We sang to make ourselves happy. Uh, and I think that in a nutshell is what, you know, having the games is all about. It's, it's not an expression of uh, uh, ambivalence or indifference to the pandemic. It's not uh, an expression of joy per se, but it's something that will make us happy. So how do you, I, how, how, do, how do you, uh, and, and this is actually a, probably a philosophical question you and I've had many times, how do you, and where do you draw the line between sports being escapism and, or sports being a reflection of life? I think it's more uh, the latter. It is a reflection of life. And it's interesting because in the advocacy of women's professional soccer, let's say, people would say, is it a charity? Is it a business? What is it? Uh, I think it, I truly think it is a, a microcosm of courage. It is a microcosm of the crosshairs we find ourselves in in lives. Uh, how do we coexist with others? How do we find the uh, courage to put up with the pressure we suddenly face? Uh, you know, it is, it is just a great experiment on the way to how we live our lives. So it's very worthwhile in that regard. It obviously combines mind and body. So it's very philosophically wise in that regard. It's good for our health. Uh, and then the entertainment, John, uh, again, as I said, it's, it's to make us happy. I mean, in the end, uh, there's a lot of things you can say about what we want to achieve in the time we're here. But I think to be happy is fundamental to, to what makes it worthwhile and and so we just do it and have it to make ourselves happy not, not i suppose it's escape and you you always need to pop out of the thing that's obsessing you in order to find that invention uh, but i just think it's really critical to make oneself happy and and to do it as a group that you know the, the good wishes that happen it's not happening in the arenas right now but the good wishes that surround cheering for your team uh, almost supersede anything that happens in a school or a hospital or a church it's just so many people wishing you know like when when Gretzky when Dustin Johnson won the Masters and I hate to drop names but when I texted Wayne to congratulate his de facto son-in-law on winning name the dropper. Augusta yeah I'm sorry it is a big <laughs> name drop uh, but I just I, he caught back to me in a second and the joy of Gretzky experiencing that uh, you can't beat it so I I think it's it's totally worthwhile and not as frivolous as sometimes is said. So the Dallas Stars have a boatload of players who uh, have tested positive, and uh, they will have their first three games, I believe, guys? At least. At least. Yeah. Um, postponed. Um, and I'm curious about how this is all going to um, unfold. Uh, with, in, in this context, we've, we saw the National Football League get through an entire season. Game, no games were canceled. But games were postponed. We had games played on Tuesdays because they just had to, had to keep postponing. We saw in Major League Baseball when they started, the St. Louis Cardinals and other teams got way behind because they lost games. The difference being NFL only plays once a week and Major League Baseball can do doubleheaders and they even went into seven-inning doubleheaders. That possibility really does not exist with the National Hockey League. So I ask this question, not knowing the answer. What is the NHL's response to we get to the end of the year and some team or a bunch of teams haven't played as many games as the other? How do you compute the playoffs if those teams are close? Well, John, do you want to take first stab at that? No, you're you're the you're the hockey guy. You're on TV. You're I'm both not hockey TV. guys. Don't kid I'm not, a, I'm not on TV. <laughs> well, but I, I think you're more of an insider than I am. Uh, what, what you, as you know, Bob, there's contingency. There's a week uh, built in at the end, and there's slots during the season for games to be replayed. Um, and then, if if and Bettman has said, you know, we we've got every 
contingency, uh, but it will go back to the percentages. The same thing they did with the 24 teams last year when they went to a, a percentage uh, of what was basically seven eighths of a season. Uh, that's how they'll have to do it. And uh, they think they will just go to 16 teams though, using percentages and everybody's amenable. Everybody's just trying to you know, push this through and hopefully uh, reboot uh, for the next season, 21-22. The, the interesting thing is, uh, is that uh, not only right now does it affect Dallas, but it affects Florida, where they were going to start their season. Uh, and uh, they have, if you look at the schedule, there are those extra dates in the middle, uh, plus the seven days at the end of the season that uh, hopefully, if there's it needs to be a game or two played, they will. Um, but uh, I, I truly believe in many ways, when and this is... This is where Gary and Bill and Steve Hatsopetros, who does the schedule, I mean, they're flying by the seat of their pants too. They're learning something every day as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've been warned of the pandemic that was at this point going to be near its pinnacle. And, and, and now we're getting a sense it could be worse in the next three weeks. So from that perspective, they're, they're learning on the fly just like we are. And, having, and unfortunately, having to make decisions that impact a lot of people uh, over the next 116 days, is, which is how long the regular season is. Well, um, the thing you like too, the Canadian division. Add, it, One of the yes, so I, of course I do. I, although, like anything else, I would love to see McKinnon and Crosby. But if I was a fan, but there are no fans, so what's the difference? Uh, you can watch them on uh, TV somewhere. Um, you know, the other thing, Bob, is with the curfews in Quebec and with uh, so many restaurants and bars uh, handicapped by COVID-19. Uh, again, I think it's worth the effort. I don't know, you know, Gary Bettman said uh, yesterday or the day before that the losses are now going to be into the billions. Um, and, and the fact is that the owners would probably lose less money not playing at all. So I think there is, uh, and I, I feel a little bit, you know, like I'm rationalizing because it's my livelihood and I'm part of it. Um, but I, I honestly think it's a uh, it's worth, like I said, uh, it's wartime entertainment for me. And uh, I think it will, it will go a long way to providing some uh, relief, as John called it, or escape for uh, the frontline workers who are, how they're holding it together almost a year into this thing. And for those who have, uh, say, a winery or a bar, uh, to keep that energy of, of, of this particular mm -hmm. strong pillar of, of their business going uh, is is worth all this nuisance and uh, heartache that we're going to endure. Well, one of the things we're seeing here or going to see is this condensed schedule, as we have alluded to. Um, the parallel to that is probably the NBA. And what the NBA has done almost consistently across the board is given especially key players days off, games off. That is not the tradition of the National Hockey League. The tradition is, if you're healthy, you play. But do you think, guys, we're going to see the NHL coaches, general managers, adapt that philosophy? And if you've got to play four games in six nights or whatever, maybe some of the star players get the odd night off. For sure. As an example, Jake Allen to Montreal seems really unusual. Uh, why would you bring a goalie into a place with Carey Price and there's only 56 games? But it's for that very reason, Bob. Now, goaltenders are a completely different story because they're a bunch of wimps, or at least they're treated like a bunch of wimps. Yeah. Because, because look, at, we grew up in an era... Glenn well, Hall played 500, you you, okay, you five, Glenn Hall played 502 consecutive <laughs> games and got on trains and, you know, travel was not what it is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, as a former target, I don't think a, a goalie needs a night off. If you're hurt, fine. If you're sore because you got getting beat up by the puck, although they don't seem to feel it anymore. We used to Don't you think, Bob, uh, like everybody can shoot now? Uh, no, know, my, my guy, Jacques Plant, who I loved, he had to scout five teams. He had to know who was the best shooter on five teams. And there was one on each. Don't you think Good job? Most Good of year. the, most of the goalies right now are breaking down with their hips because of this, you know, hybrid butterfly and, uh, the physical demands of air travel, uh, the absolute, uh, array of shooters. Now that obviously is reduced with divisional play this year, but I, I think 
the position is so difficult. And 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 okay, let's just say you're, you're right. Uh, you go on to uh, players. I, I I do think it will be necessary. Uh, there, there's they're deep rosters, right? Why would you have Jason Spezza and Joe Thornton? Well, I agree. I would agree with that. You know, I I just wonder. You know, philosophically, the NHL has not had that in their. No, I don't system. think I. You know what? I I don't. You don't think, think, think they will. I don't. I don't think anything changes. Uh, you, you know, I think that right. if you if, if you get a player, I mean, I mean, I think the best example might be Steven Stamkos, uh, because we all know what he went through last year to to win the Stanley Cup. Yeah, not and to interrupt, I, John, but that's that in the injury scenario is one that I think is separate from this. I'm not talking about that. That's understandable. Guys had how how many times has this guy had catastrophic injuries that oh, no. have kept him out for prolonged but, periods? But, but so he's fragile, okay. you know. So I but, get but that. It, it, but I tell you what, I mean, if, if John Cooper walks over to Stephen Stamkos in the in the locker room, or if he's allowed to, he, I mean, he might have to do it on a Zoom call and say, Stephen, listen, do you want to go tonight? Stephen Stamkos is going to say yes. He's still going to say yes. It's not going to be. By the way, we're going to hold you out. Stamkos would have a fit. And it would be Steven Samkos being able to say, I want to play. I'm ready to play. I can Well, that's go. the question. But there have and, been two. And, and I don't think that I don't think that I don't think that part of the code or whatever you want to call, it, I don't think that changes because I I, I do think that the, every player and every coach says 56 games, holy smokes, we can't afford to not have our best lineup in every night because it's gonna be it's gonna be a real sprint to the to the playoffs. And I gotta play. I but you do what's going to happen. You do have to think long term, right? So Scotty Bowman would send Larry Robinson to Florida uh, to rest him a little bit. And you saw what the Raptors did with Kawhi Leonard. And funny enough, you saw what Tampa attempted with Blake Snell uh, in the World Series. So, so those are two uh, opposite sides of the coin. In the Raptors case, uh, the time management. By the uh, way, you did see what happened with Kawhi Leonard in, in, uh, it, with the Clippers and it backfired on him. Right. So, <laughs> so it, yeah, that's right. There, there are definitely this last five years, uh, Bob. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, experimenting with analytics and with, uh, with you know, as uh, Pierre Dorian said, if I hear rest as a weapon one more time, <laughs> uh, so he he lost interest in it. But uh, it's a it's a fascinating part of what everybody's been thinking about uh, in all of the sports. One of the things that we have discussed um, a fair bit on this program is this a program. Can we call this a program? Yeah, we can. We'll yeah. call it a pod. Call it a podcast. Just don't call it radio, like you tried to yesterday. I didn't do anything yesterday. I didn't talk to you okay. yesterday. Oh, stop it! Stop it! Just go. Now I can't remember where I was going to go with that. With now that on this we, the thing we talk about a lot on this program, uh, with uh, respect to rest of athletes, or no, uh, I had nothing to do with that. I don't remember what the hell it was. I'll, it'll come back to me at some point in time, or perhaps it won't. You know. With One thing I wanted to tell you, uh, if I had a chance on the show, since we're in a bit of a... Oh, yeah, here, go ahead. Yeah. You know Robert McNeil of the McNeil Air Report? Sure. sure. Yeah. So he's 90 on the 19th. God bless him. Uh, it's this week, anyway. His birthday, I believe it's uh, the 19th. He born in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia? Uh, he's, he's, uh, born in Montreal, but he certainly oh, okay. went to Dell. He went to okay. Dalhousie. He, had, uh, he lived in Halifax for quite a time. Went to Carleton <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that that newscast was considered the bow tie of news, was what they called it, and uh, and yet uh, he did a lot of great stuff with the Sesame Street characters. He he was there for JFK for the assassination at uh, Dealey Plaza. Uh, he he did the Cuban Missile Crisis. He did Watergate. Uh, he came back during 9/11 to work for sure. PBS. The so, McNeil Lair Report. That's what it was. Yeah, just a just a great great journalist whose birthday is coming up, and uh, yeah, he, he was a, he was at a time when you know when we gathered around the television to find out. Uh, so a very, very neat uh, mention I wanted to throw out there. Thank you for the delay, Mr. McLean, uh, uh, okay. because I have now recalled what I was Good. going to say. <laughs> so one of the things that we have addressed, don't interrupt, John, um, is the validity of this Canadian division. We understand that this is a, a move that has been made out of, of um, presumed necessity. And we are not here to uh, suggest that it was a bad idea by any stretch of the imagination. It seems logical. Players crossing the border is problematic. And so um, this is a way to solve that problem. Um, I posed to the, um, the idiots that I was um, engaged with the other day, including Shannon, 
that this might be the forerunner of something more permanent, the concept of a Canadian division. Understanding that, as with baseball, team goes in, you play a usually three or four game series. What's going to happen this year is, you know, hypothetically, Toronto is going to go to Vancouver. They're going to play two games in a couple of three days in Vancouver. Then they'll go and do the same thing in Calgary, then the same thing in Edmonton. I'm hypothesizing, of course, but this notion of multiple games almost back to back, which has never existed in hockey before. What of the idea that this Canadian division may become a permanent thing and in conjunction with it, the concept that a team from the East can go to the West and play a couple games in three days and nothing wrong with that. What do you think? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in, John, and then you can kind of give the actual. Well, we all, we know what John thinks already. Here, here's, here's one thing that happened, Bob, with Rogers hometown hockey, uh, bless their hearts, the NHL and Steve Hatsopetros would work uh, diligently to give us a Canadian team on a Sunday night. But invariably, to get a Canadian team on a Sunday night, it meant they were playing Saturday night and Sunday night. Mm -hmm. So we were getting the second game in as many nights and usually the fourth and three nights, or sorry, the third and four nights. Uh, we got a lousy game. We, we, uh, we rarely got a Canadian team at their best. Uh, and, and this year it became impossible uh, because of what you're discussing. So like Toronto will play uh, Friday night in Ottawa and Saturday night in Ottawa, am I not mistaken? I think that's how it's going this weekend. Uh, so what would they be like, those teams? They're playing each other. That's the break. Uh, so they, they both are on the second game of a two and two nights. But that, that, was a, that was a concern for us with the scheduling on Rogers Hometown Hockey, and it will be going forward in, in years to come to, to find a way to get the Canadian teams on Sunday, when, of course, mm -hmm. Saturday is sacrosanct. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued by, by the reference to um, uh, your program, but my question more specifically is, what about a Canadian division going forward? Is there something inherently wrong with this? Here is the perfect opportunity mm -hmm. to test pilot this notion well maybe that's and what they're test piloting well and i i think it's got you know who knows how it's going to turn out but i think it's got a chance to be something permanent john does not what I do you don't. think yeah I, I do i think uh you know again it's it, it'll probably i mean is it cost effective to go back and forth from uh montreal and ottawa and toronto to vancouver versus a, a north south alignment i imagine it makes no difference. But uh, other than that, I think, you know, in the old days, we would have been furious not to see Mario Lemieux and so forth uh, as a season's ticket holder. So there, that'll be uh, the only thing I think holding it back. Otherwise, uh, if, if we feel a real energy around it, and conversely, if we feel a real energy around the other divisions and the mm -hmm. rivalries created, you might see that you're right, Bob. Well, well but what's except, it, what's except, important? except, it, except it, it, in the end, Ron, you, you, you're, you're now going to tell people, Montreal Canadian fans in the province of Quebec and the Maritimes that they're going to have to stay up till 11 o'clock at night. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. The and, time and, zone and, thing and, is and, an issue. Well, yeah. no, it is the, it is the thing. I mean, that's, you remember, that's what Kenny Dryden did. To get I can the solve that one right now. I can solve that one right now. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Play earlier. And then you're going to piss off no. everybody in the no, West. No, 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 no. Teams make two trips west a year. Is that correct, generally speaking? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, that was with, yeah, the old schedule. Yeah. So two, two things. Number one, you're not going to play an 82-game schedule all against Canadian teams. You're going to still, that's going to be your division. You're still going to have your game against Mario and, or not Mario, but uh, Sydney, Sydney and, sure. and, 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 and the pay. You're still going to see OV and, and the other guys. They'll still be sprinkled in the way they were. Now what you do, what you eliminate are those trips to um, L.A., Anaheim, um, San Jose, Arizona. Eliminate those trips and replace them with the Van another Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton trip. And you it, get it's, a Canadian team into the final four, uh, which is, you know, without a This may be the only three. way to do it. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I think it has merit, Bob. I really do. I think there'll Thank be, uh, and, I, and I also like uh, scarcity. So if, if, if you do kind of uh, cordon off Canada a little bit, and, you know, there was always like the World Series. We don't know what's going to happen when the NL and the AL meet. Um, I, I like- But, the, but baseball screwed that up too, though. So. Uh, a little bit, yes. 
That's true. Although, for the most part, the teams that make for the most part, which is what you're talking series about. don't play during but, the regular season. But you, but you touched on you touched on one of the key issues, Ron, right at the beginning when when when, uh, when Bob asked you, and that was we were upset that we didn't see Mario. Yeah. And so, you know, you 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 want to make sure that all the stars of all the teams get into it, your arena because remember, this is still a this is still a gate driven league. I don't care what you say. Yeah. You, you know, it's special to have Sidney Crosby go to Calgary. Yeah. It's special to have. Uh, well, let me ask you, though, John, would you want to see Sid or would you want to see the Oilers play the Flames if you're a flame or a season or Oilers season ticket holder? Uh, well, I want both. But I think I, that, see, I, I think see, the one see, that's so high, I, mean, I think the rivalries, uh, the Canadian rivalries, I think I may be wrong. Uh, the Canadian rivalries are a better draw. But this is an east-west east thing. This is this is not a this is not a Calgary Edmonton thing. This is an east-west thing. Know, it, but it, you know how it, you know it, how it is when Toronto's in Edmonton or Vancouver. Sorry. No, no, I, I agree. But but it, it's not just the Maple Leafs. It's Ottawa and Montreal too. And so you know, I mean, I you know, I mean, this you know, the the the, the whole concept of doing this and then and and all those Leaf fans being happy and Montreal fans being happy, but you have to satisfy Ottawa too. So I mean, there there's a fairness. And this is something that the league guys and those of us that were at the league, you know, there's always that, well, it's really good for the stars, but what about, what about everybody else? And yeah, there has to be a fairness doctrine in all this to make it work. Turn on the uh, television. And, you can see them anytime you want. No, all no, the games are on. No, well, no, you even know, no, no, no. Look, well, here's, I'll tell you, uh, you know, there's a time-worn phrase. You can finish it. Familiarity breeds yeah. contempt. Sure, sure. And we all understand that when a playoff series arrives, the, one of the reasons we get so excited is we know by game three at the latest, these two teams probably dislike each other. And that's going to be reflected in what happens on the ice. And that advanced tension is part of what attracts us to that. If you recreate that during the regular season, how is that not good? I think it is. And I also think, you know, there's so many, it's, it's such a cross pollination in the country of, uh, you know, people living in one part of the country who have roots in the other. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and that will really be manifest in, in this particular alignment. So I think, I think it has all the makings of, uh, of something very good. Uh, I'll give you another example uh, by, by, by accident. Uh, last weekend in the National Football League, the Pittsburgh Steelers played the Cleveland Browns oh, for the second we, week we in a row. We waited 30 minutes to hear about the Cleveland Browns. Well, they're moving on. And um, <laughs> as my friend Paul Jones said, and I still laugh about it, he, he sent out a text after the game. He said, the uh, Steelers are off to the CEO-ass down room. And, and it's... <laughs> been a long time for Cleveland Browns fans yeah. but they played two weeks in a row <clears throat> was the second game less interesting anticlimactic quite the opposite right so I I think this has a yeah. chance look at before we let you go here McLean it is um it is inevitable that on uh, on any program on any interview in any conversation at the beginning of every season you must uh project your opinion as to the conclusion of the season. As ridiculous an exercise as this has always been and will continue to be, uh, I am not going to take it away. Is there any reason to believe that something really unusual might happen in this somewhat shortened season? Or do you think 56 games is basically gonna be the same as 82? And like last year, Tampa Bay, who was no surprise, the LA Dodgers were no surprise, is, the best team still going to win? Should, because of the playoffs being the, the normal four rounds of best of seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the, the question marks for me, and I don't know, if John, if you've gone through this, but two of the best teams, uh, two of the most hopeful teams, for sure, Colorado, their talent is just like otherworldly, but they're goaltending. Same with Edmonton. Talent's otherworldly, uh, at least up front, uh, but they're goaltending. So those are mm -hmm. huge question marks around them. Tampa loses Kucherov, but gets Stamkos hopefully back. Uh, I think Buffalo is a great dark horse uh, story. Uh, you do, huh? You I do. do. I think I think wow. that uh, Dylan Cousins is a. You know, it's funny, John. I've been thinking about a number of things. In Canada, they all loaded up on right-hand shots. Kyle Turris and Tyson Berry going over to Edmonton. Corey Perry and Josh Anderson and Tyler Toffoli into Montreal. Toronto gets Wayne Simmons and uh, the. the uh, 
you know, Calgary picks up Tanev and, and Josh Levo. Uh, the right-hand shots uh, is one, one of the funny things that I'm kind of keying on. And uh, the, the other thing that I think a lot about is just, uh, you know, will, will Dylan Cousins and uh, Taylor Hall and Eric Stahl, uh, you, you, you know, in the, it, there's always that, Shanahan was the guy for Detroit. They picked him up and it changed everything. Fedorov and Iserman tried to lead, but when they brought in Shanahan, they were set. Forsberg and Sakic tried to lead Colorado. When they brought in Patrick Roy, they were set. Mario Lemieux tried to lead, but when they brought, could be Trotchy, but that's second year. Francis is the guy. Uh, sure. Goring was the guy to kind of take care of Potvan and Trotchy's leadership. Who are those guys? Uh, yeah. Which team has found that uh, particular catalyst? Uh, and I think, you know, Toronto string with Joe Thornton. Is that the guy? Hmm. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I, as I say, Buffalo's my coming way out of left field dark horse. Uh, and, and then I think it's, I think it's Colorado's cup to win. Shouldn't Tavares have been the guy? Wasn't Tavares supposed to be the guy well, to lead we, Toronto? We, we, listen, yeah. The, the, the leadership, the, the leadership issue in Toronto, they, they brought John Tavares in to try to lead. They brought pa Patrick Marlowe in to try to lead. They brought Jason Spetz in to try to lead. Now they're bringing Joe Thornton in to try to lead. Wayne Simmons brought in. To, they've gotten older and slower. Uh, I, I, and, I, there's, and everybody there's, thinks they're going to win there's the Canadian something division. Missing, there's something missing in Toronto, whether it's in the room or between the years. There's something missing in Toronto. We know there's talent, but it, it, is there enough character? But that's a, and that's roster. something missing was always missing with the island and it, it sure. made no sense until goring uh right. it was missing uh with detroit horribly you know how, how how bad was the 93 loss to toronto the 94 to san jose the 95 sweep to the new jersey devils they always blame goaltending they always blame goaltending and yeah. but, but it wasn't it was the other well it, it is a big thing though but it, yeah. it, there's no question it's a big thing um but i, I think in the case of toronto uh look I believe uh, Hedman and Chara and Petrangelo or, or uh, uh, Colton Pareko, those big stud defensemen, sure. that is, is Muzzin able to handle those minutes and be that guy? Is, you know, I mean, Zach Bogosian is going to be uh, one of your, I, I thought Toronto would sort of move toward the 7-11 format where they have 11 forwards and 7-D and Bogosian certainly familiar with it. And I, I know Kyle Dubas is a fan. Uh, because now you're allowed to bring Marner and uh, Matthews more into the mix. The, sure. I, I, I think Sheldon Keefe has steered clear of it, but I would look for that from the Maple Leafs. Well, I, 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 think the, the, I, I think with the taxi squads and this 56 tight schedule playing rivals back to back, I think you're going to see a lot of that before yes. it's over. It may not start that way, but I think you're going to see a lot of that before it's over. Well, I'm probably, you know, if it's possible, a lot more fourth line play. A lot more yeah. teams... Yeah. You know, but that fourth line would be two two of the fourth line with with Marner or Matthews. Oh, I get in that in a, in an eleven seven format. Yes, yeah, you're yes. right. Yeah. Which which by the way is I I mean I I'm starting to really like Winnipeg because they got Nate Thompson and Trevor Lewis on their fourth line. I mean they got quality leadership guys on their fourth line that have been through the been through those type of wars. Who I think are going to get more minutes this year, don't you? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do. Yeah, I think they're going to be you know they where they might have get eight to ten, they may get fourteen now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. McLean. Oh, um, hold on. Hold on. Hold oh, on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, you, you do this to me all the time. I know because I don't, we don't communicate at all. So I have to ask my question now. There is the so understatement we, of all time. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, so we, we, we did it with Don when he was on, we asked him late in the interview, whether you have talked and, and he said, no. Uh, so uh, it's been a while. Have you, have you and Don talked? Yes, we have John. He actually, uh, when I heard grapes, uh, in August, you and uh, Bob were interviewing Don, and it was lovely because it was, you know, what do you think of the hockey? And he said, I kind of like it. And uh, it broke my heart, right? Because, uh, yeah, you know, it, it is what it was. Um, but he had already, he and I had corresponded by uh, mail, by handwritten letter, which is beautiful. Uh, but I, I dropped off some beer on uh, Christmas Eve, and, and Don phoned, and then he and I talked uh, good. on Boxing Day for a, a good hour. It, it, you know, we didn't talk. It's funny. We didn't. I mean, obviously, our our politics are a mile apart, uh, and so we were always afraid we would ruin uh, our relationship if we talked too much, because uh, we had some really feisty, funny nights over beers and peanuts. Uh, but we miss them, both of us do, and uh, yeah, that's just uh, he's doing well, and he and Tim have their their podcast, so. Sure. 
that, that we'll always have 33 great years uh, to celebrate. Well, you know, I, and I, I, I will say this uh, to you. Uh, it was always a bother after things went down. As someone who uh, I view myself as a friend of both of you, mm -hmm. that there wasn't that communication. Yeah. Uh, and whether there had to be healing or whether there had to be something, but uh, the fact that now that uh, through the holidays you were able to talk is uh, puts a smile on my face for a new year. I think we all feel that way. Thank you, John. Yeah. Now, John? Yeah. Go on, Bob, <laughs> you, you, you can finish now. Thank you. See, you guys so, exist like grapes Ronnie, and I did. Ronnie, just so you know, he thinks I try to produce this show like yeah. I tried to produce you. So, or you, nothing's it's exactly nothing, the same. Nothing, nothing, nothing I don't changed. think it. Nothing I know it. it. No. I know it. Oh, oh stop. I think John of I think John of us driving to was it Longfellow's Wayside Inn? Is that in Connecticut? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I just think of my my start of seasons and uh, and Shannon at the helm uh, driving the car, uh -huh. producing the show, like everything from what we ate to how we spoke. Uh, yeah, it's okay, Bob. Yeah. It's, no, it's actually it. kind of a, yeah, it's actually kind of fun, as you know. Kind of uh, kind of nice of you to mention that one where I got my hundred and sixty three dollars feeding right. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the presidents of the United States, but we won't go there. <laughs> oh no, we were. That's right, we were. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that was. You know how long ago that was? Yeah, it's eighty four. Nineteen eighty four. Yeah. Oh, I just read a great book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, Turbulent wow. Times Leadership. Right, it's the story of Lincoln and the two Roosevelts and Lyndon ah. Johnson. So, wow. How many books stuff. did you read in the uh, uh, during the break this time? Oh, ton. Yeah, it, as you know, ethically, we're trying to figure out uh, so many things. So, some hockey books. Uh, Caleb Dahlgren, Humboldt Broncos, has a great new one coming out. Crossroads. Uh, yeah. That, that's uh, keep your eye out in March. Uh, I obviously read Harner Ryan's. A lot of them I read because I'm involved in them. But yeah, Berkey's, Burke's Law, and so on. Uh, Mr. McLean, it's always our pleasure. We thank you for your time. Uh, we um, wish you the best. Uh, enjoy the year. Enjoy the season, and we'll hopefully chat with you uh, as things progress. Thanks, Thanks Bobcat. Thanks, John. Cheers. Ron McLean of Hockey Night in Canada. We'll be back Friday. See you then.